Hi, it's Bridget. Welcome to Above Life Channel. The purpose here is to inspire your spirit and to fill you up with hope. Today, I am going to do a channeling that's a little bit different for me, and I feel like it needs to be done, so I am going to do it. Usually, I try to avoid the drama. I try to avoid the controversy, conspiracy stuff, but I think this is an important thing to bring forward because the energy of forgiveness and healing is present. So I am going to channel with Paul Prentner, who was one of the people that was around Freddie Mercury and in his entourage early on. And if you've seen the movie or the biopic uh, Bohemian Rhapsody, you understand that Paul Prentner's part was one that was considered very villainous and bringing in some um, trying to separate him from Queen, from his friends, kind of isolate him. And, and there's a lot of um, kind of selfish motives that are implied and manipulation and all this stuff. So I felt like after talking with Freddie and after talking with him many, many times, you guys, there's a playlist. You're probably watching it right now for Freddie Mercury here at Above Life Channel. And He's such a joy, you guys. His energy is so sweet and sincere and open and really communicates very, very well and reflects into the human life experience better than many of the spirits that I've talked to to date. And maybe it's just because I've built a spiritual afterlife friendship with him. <laughs> so it's easy to talk to him about stuff and I can hear him really clearly now. It's getting better and better, the audience, clear audience part. So. Maybe that's why, but I felt like this Paul Prentner piece is important. Paul is also in the afterlife and it's, it's important to bring this in because of the forgiveness piece and the healing. So let's bring him in. He's sitting right straight across from me. It's interesting. So Freddie Mercury's energy is to my left and straight ahead of me, well, he's off to the side here. And then straight ahead to me is Paul's energy. Hello, Paul. He says, hello. He makes eye contact with me, but kind of looks down. Remember, I'm clairvoyant, so I see when I channel, I see and I sense feel. So clairvoyance is the channel I'm accessing most of the time. Clairsentience, the feeling of energy and then interpreting it into words is the secondary channel that I use as well. And then clairaudience, which is hearing, I'm pretty good at, but sometimes it's spotty for me. So sometimes it's my words chosen based on the energy of what's coming forward. But he feels rather, he's kind of looking down a little bit and then he looks back up to me and he has very striking eyes. That's one of the features that I'm noticing in him is very, you have very striking eyes. He says, thank you. And he sits and he's kind of like in a leather looking chair is what it looks like. I mean, we're in my kitchen right now, hello, if you're literal. But I see this kind of leather looking chair and he's like, like here to clear the air. And there's this pent up energy, a little bit of a, almost nervousness and I know you're gonna be like I would be if I was watching a, a psychic channel I'd be like how can a spirit be nervous it's because there is a representation energy around him that the collective all of our energies after watching the movie or from people who are around Freddie at that time or for people who are fans of Freddie Mercury and know a lot about his, his life, understand that there's a huge energy that's been placed, a big cloud placed around Paul as like he's the reason why Freddie um, got sick. He's the reason why Freddie got AIDS. He's the reason why Freddie um, used pills or drank too much or you know had a wild lifestyle. It's all because of Paul. No, if you've listened to and watched the other channeling I've done with Freddie, if this is your first one, please spend some time on the Freddie Mercury playlist because he actually, in one of my first transformative channels I did with Freddie Mercury, he talks about Paul and he's very kind about it. So, and, and there's a forgiveness energy there. So Paul, I want, I don't necessarily want to bring forward your side of the story. That's not the goal. Um, the goal is to allow you a platform from the afterlife to help clear some of this energy around you that I feel like if it can clear for you, because you're like this big target now, everybody just bleh, is channeling this negative energy at you. And it's negative energy isn't good for any of us. So if we can clear that for everyone as much as possible for the people who are connected into Freddie Mercury, to Queen, to the afterlife, channeling stuff, whether it's on Above Life Channel or others, I think it's really gonna be helpful. 
So what do you have to say? Is there anything that you want to come forward with? He says, oh boy, that's just got, I just got a hit in the gut. Right at the solar plexus. Oh, punching that spirit chakra inside the body. Ouch, okay. He says, um, everybody makes mistakes. And everybody's responsible, everyone is responsible for their own choices. He says, I take responsibility. And he says, it's not uncommon to have a bad guy. There's always a bad guy. He's actually, he just reaches forward for a cigarette. Um, he says, um, there's not much that can be said that hasn't already been released or revealed. He says, the damage has been done. I don't ask for anyone's forgiveness, he says. I've received it from Freddie, and that's what's important in the afterlife. He has an interesting, the way he talks is interesting because he says words and then it kind of drops them. He says a word and it drops. It says, he's got an accent, that's what I'm trying to say. Um, I can't blame anyone. My parents, my family. I felt isolated. I felt alone. And I, uh, I will recognize, he says, I, I took advantage of that. I probably, he says, probably took advantage of that. In Freddie, I saw the same thing. I felt a connection to him the first day I met him. And he seemed like this, just this innocent, sweet person. And I didn't start off, I didn't intend to take advantage of him. I just, I simply, like everyone else, fell in love with him. It's easy to fall in love with Freddie Mercury, you know. On the stage, he's larger than life, but when he's in the studio and making music, it's amazing to see that. That's really where you see him. You really can see his soul there. And after a while, I suppose I got jealous, he says. I wanted more. I was afraid that I would be cast aside and forgotten. You know, he did love Mary so very much, and everyone knows that. It seemed like in order to be with Freddie, you had to create your own world with him. You know, there's not much that can be explained. I don't, uh, I wouldn't expect anyone to understand, is what he says. Mm. But in the afterlife, there is, there is forgiveness and mercy. There's a grace that comes if you allow yourself to receive it. It was kind of ironic, I suppose, that I died prior to Freddie. I never wanted to be alone. We had that in common. That's a common thing. I, I believe Freddie had some compassion for that in me. But I will say I took advantage. I did, I most certainly did. But I was afraid. I didn't really know what love was or what it meant. And I don't think I let myself even get, even dream about that, he says. So can you talk about then, so you, and you went after your, okay, let's talk about, there's so many things I could ask you about. I don't want to get into too much drama, trauma stuff. I mean, I mean, after all, I am channeling Paul, right? And Paul knows a lot about the inside stuff about Freddie. I understand my understanding as a viewer when I watched the movie Bohemian Rhapsody, I understand that the Paul character was a compilation of multiple um, sort of individuals that were around Freddie during the time when he started to um, explore and go outside of his reality of his, 
his family of queen and his um, his relationship with Mary and his family, his 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 birth family and all that, and really try to f- kind of find himself and explore and you know the crazy parties and and the party scenes, having parties at his house and and um, and then also you know going clubbing and all that. What part did you play in all of that? He says all of it. I was I was there for everything. It looks almost though like in the movie you're depicted as like this puppet master, like orchestrating him not to do this and orchestrating him not to do that, like really manipulative and like devious, you know? So that's a character in a movie, he says. That's a character in a movie. But I, he says, I can understand why I was, I was depicted in that way because ultimately I was. I could be seen as the person that introduced Freddie to this wild, reckless life. He says, you have to understand that in the time, being gay wasn't a, a thing that you could do as a normal, a, a, you couldn't do that and have a normal life. You couldn't settle down and have, have a family and children and a picket fence and all that. Like he's showing me, you couldn't have, he's trying to, he's conveying, as I'm seeing, he's speaking to me in imagery right now, that he couldn't have like a normal, a normal life, a normal is such a loose term, you guys, hello. He couldn't, it wasn't possible at the, in those times for people who were gay to be a couple in public and live in a neighborhood and walk their dog and have a white picket fence and adopt children or have children, you know, I mean, it wasn't, it was like totally unheard of, like not even imaginable, not even imaginable. He says it was so, we were so vilified, he says. We, the gay population, is what Paul is saying, was so vilified. He says, you know, and it's, it, it corrupts you. He says it does corrupt you. It, it, you. You lose your sense of yourself when everyone outside of the community that you're in, whether it be the, the gay bar down the street or your friends who are gay and, and a few others that accept that, you know, lifestyle, it, it really becomes your own world because you're not accepted as you are in a way that most relationships are accepted. And so and he says, it's a, society wasn't ready for any of that kind of reality. He says it couldn't have been reality. It wasn't real for us. So, you know. We were reckless, yes. He says, we were wild. He says, it, it was free. You know, it was freeing to not, to just let everything go. You know, he makes me feel like there's ecstasy involved, just so you know, like the drug ecstasy. I feel that. I shouldn't say I feel that. <laughs> I sense that energy, <laughs> that ecstasy was involved in some really adventurous things. So let's just say that. Um, and not that that's right or wrong, not that we should be judging that, but it almost seems like it was to the extreme. So are you really the person that introduced that? He says, oh, I just brought out the side that was already there. He says, there is an impulsive side to Freddie Mercury. He says, a side that was caged for many, many years, and once that was let out of the cage, then he was free to be himself and to express himself, and he wanted to have... I feel, I believe, he says, this is what Paul's saying, I believe he wanted to have the experiences he couldn't have had before. I said, okay, Paul, but it's excessive. And you, it seems like you just kept like feeding him the alcohol and feeding him the pills. And is that true? Like that was depicted in the movie that way. He says, yes. He says, yes, it wasn't, he said, it wasn't just me. He says, so was Freddie an addict? He says, well, I'd say he's an alcoholic. If I was going to say anything, I would say yes. He said, but we all were. That's what you did to numb your pain during the daylight hours. Trying to be a normal person and forget about your shadow, you know, like your dark side and at night. And I'm like, okay, okay, Paul. But so if the gay, um, the gay part of you that was out expressing, like I hate, I hate to uh, affiliate being gay with like, being promiscuous. I mean, that's so stereotype stuff. That's so like way old fashioned, not real. 
not up with the times, you know? I mean, that's so awful to, Kamala, I don't affiliate those things together because that's not true. There are people, and there were people, there have to have been people at that time that weren't like, you know, I mean, come on, come on, come on. You can't just say, well, everybody does it, so that's what we're gonna do. You can't, you can't use that as an excuse. So help us to understand this because it looks like, it looks like there was um, like maybe sex addiction, addiction to pills or drugs of whatever type, and alcohol, and alcohol is a drug, but I'm considering, because you already said alcoholic would be the thing you would consider. But he said everybody was. And then you refer to the evening, like going out and having crazy parties and stuff and very adventurous experiences, let's say that. Do you, but you refer to that as almost like this thing you have to hide, like it's the bad part. He says, well, it's like a drug. He said, it's like a drug. You have to understand, he says, he says I mean no disrespect, he says to me. I don't mean no disrespect. But you have to understand that it was different. And being gay was like an addiction, is what it was like perceived as. Like it was this thing that you do, but you don't talk about it. You only talk about it with the people who do it. It's, it's just like, it was just like drugs or um, going to the bar and drinking. And I mean, it, and it was all of that. You have to understand, he says, you got, I don't mean any disrespect, he says, but you have to understand it was very different times then. You know, he says, you're talking about the 70s and 80s. He says, my God, you weren't even, you were barely born in the 70s. <laughs> like, okay. Yeah, so he's right. I mean, and I, you know, I didn't, I wasn't raised during that time necessarily. Like, I didn't, wasn't conscious of it. I was like a kid, you know, in white suburbia and, and not, no clue about that, right? Which is kind of ironic that my dad was gay, huh? Not ironic. Probably common where people who were gay felt like they had to hide it, whether they were men or women. And it almost seems like the gay population of men in particular, because of the AIDS epidemic, is totally like identified with gay men and not women, but there were gay women and gay women, and women in general get AIDS too, but it seems like this, there was like this stereotype like, is that, and he says, you have to remember that that's when AIDS did come on the scene. And he's right, you know, in the eight, early 80s and, it was kind of seen as this um, consequence of being gay, being a gay man. Oh, okay, well, okay, Paul, okay. But it's not a consequence of being a gay man. If you're in a monogamous relationship and you're having safe sex, you wouldn't, you know, that would not be your scenario. So you can't, we, uh, to help us try to understand this, I guess what you're trying to portray in our conversation here is the, the times were so different then. I mean, you're talking the 80s, right? Yeah, I mean, that's like 40 years ago. That's a long time ago. So yeah, things should be different. Half, almost half a century, things were totally different. He says, you know, it's almost like, it's like the, he's equating this, people are gonna be not happy about this. But Paul is equating it to like the civil rights movement, you know, like gay people coming out and, you know, and, uh, We, were, we had such a strong community, he says, because we had to be close and we had to, you know, do, the, do whatever we were gonna do out in the open, like our, our relationships, our normal things had to be in private. Normal things, you know, like holding hands, going to the grocery store, that doesn't, he says, that doesn't happen. That didn't happen during our time. You have to understand that. During Freddie's time and my time, that did not happen, he says. That was not what happened. You can look back, it's easy to look back and say, well, why didn't you do this and why didn't you do that? And he says, it's easy to look back with a critical view, but you have to understand what it wasn't. Things were very different. Well, okay, that's fair enough. I'll say that, that's fair enough. And I don't wanna argue what's an afterlife spirit because I know at a higher level you are a oneness energy, a vibration of oneness. He says, actually, I'm, I'm back, I'm incarnated again. He came back, he's incarnated again. He says, so, so what you are connecting with is the resonant memory or the essence of who I was and what I hold for people who are calling me up to be able to use for their own healing and their own forgiveness for their own lives. The past is something that 
that can haunt you if you let it, he says. Paul Pretner. It can haunt you if you let it. He said it should be easy enough to make different choices, you know, better choices for your life. But I'm not sure that I'm the person to give advice on that. Freddie's been here the whole time, you guys, and he's pretty quiet. So, Freddie, do you have anything to say? He says, oh, I forgive Paul. He says, I was a willing participant. I can't act like Freddie Mercury talking now. He says, I can't act like I didn't make choices because I made choices that I made. Now, was I addicted? Bridget, I know you wanted to ask me that. He puts his chin out. He says, I know you want to ask me about addic- addiction. Was I addicted? He says, yes. I would say I was a high-functioning alcoholic, if you needed to classify me. He says, if you need to put me in a box, that's what you would say. But he says, sex was an escape for me. He says, it was an escape for me. It was a, a connection to something that's indescribable. It's hard to, to put into words that, what that means. In fact, you know, Freddie, I do, we should probably have a conversation. And that would be a difficult conversation, but we could have that conversation in a channeling where we could just talk specifically about that. Would that be all right with you? He says, yes, if, you, if it would help people. If you were, he says, yes, if you're going to be okay with that. <laughs> he says, yes, if you're okay, with, if you're willing to go there. Yeah. So is there anything else related to Paul that you want to um, dispel or discuss or anything like that? He says, I agree that he was definitely, uh, he said he was vilified in the movie, I agree. And he says, and some of that is due. It's due. And he looks at Paul and says, it's due. And Paul says, hmm. Yeah. And Paul says, somebody's got to be the bad guy. And Freddie said, yeah. He says, you or me, that's what he says. You or me. Yeah, I don't feel like there's animosity or anger between the two of you. No, I forgive Paul. He says, I forgive him. You've got to take responsibility for the part, you know, for the part that you play. And I take responsibility for mine. I was angry. Freddie says, I was angry. I felt betrayed because I was. But he says, but. If I wouldn't have participated in any of that, there would be nothing to tell. He says, and those would be, no, Freddie's smoking. He's like, those would be boring stories now, wouldn't they? Hmm? Those would be boring, boring times. Hmm. He says, would I go back and change things if I could? That's a good question. He says, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I don't know the answer to that. I don't know how, if it would have been different, how it would have been different. There might have been just a different Paul, basically. He's showing me like there might have been other players, you know, or different things that happened. He says, he's showing me like the results or the outcome may have been the same. He may have still had AIDS, you know. Wow, okay, thank you so much for your time. We've been talking to Paul Pretner in the afterlife who's connected with Freddie Mercury as well. And Freddie popped in to share and connect as well during this t- our time together. This is volatile stuff. I know that this is sensitive subject matter and it's difficult for me as well. You guys know my history, that my father died of AIDS and um, he was a gay man and living in the closet. <laughs> And so I have a personal connection to this, so there's, I definitely have biases. So I hope I didn't come on too strong with Paul or be too harsh with him. I think we need to learn from Freddie's energy in the afterlife and understand that there's forgiveness and healing that comes and that we all have our own responsibility and accountability for our peace and our own lives and our decision-making processes. So 
Um, this will be interesting. This isn't a touchy-feely necessarily feel-good video, but I would love for you here at Above Life Channel to take a moment to really feel into how you are holding on to some things from your past where if you could give yourself permission and the freedom to let go of waiting for someone else to make things right or to heal your harm, the harm that has been done to you, the hurt that has been done to you, if you could just give yourself permission to be free from some of that, to feel the freedom of forgiveness in your own heart for yourself and your role or your part in that, Maybe it's not literally, like you don't have a literal part in that, but it, there's a part of you that keeps staying back in that past and you deserve better than to relive the past over and over again and be in the hurt over and over again. You deserve better. We all deserve better. Human life is not supposed to be about suffering, constant suffering and pain and there is healing and forgiveness to happen here. So I hope that you will gift yourself some of the freedom to feel some of that today. This is Bridget at Above Life Channel. Thank you so much for watching. Remember, this is your life. This right now, this present moment, it's your life. So live it. Oh, I hope you live it. Thanks for watching.